time for talk is over. Congress and the White House has to come up with something that stops this carnage. Gun control policies don't work, and they're contrary to the Constitution. That is not unconstitutional. That just is dumb. We believe in our right to defend ourselves and our families with semi-automatic firearms technology. Too many children are dying. Too many children. We must do something. Amid the divisions of the gun control debate, we examine the political forces at work. Hello, I'm Shihab Rutansi. Welcome to the second of Inside Stories special on guns, culture and crime in the United States. Mass shootings in primary schools, universities, movie theatres and places of worship. This country has seen them all. They're often followed by heartfelt statements by politicians on Capitol Hill and by the president. But little action. The killing of six- and seven-year-olds in Newtown, Connecticut last month has led to a different response. For the first time, President Barack Obama has put forth a plan he believes could decrease gun violence. And some Democrats, like Virginia Senator Mark Warner, who have been staunch supporters of gun rights, now say it is time for stricter gun control. Most Republican politicians, however, continue to oppose further firearms legislation, choosing instead to focus on the increased surveillance of the mentally ill. But are Americans as divided as their politicians? Recent polls show a majority support stricter gun control measures, like universal background checks for all gun sales and the banning of military-style semi-automatic weapons. And this week, family members of the young Newtown victims spoke out about how they want the government to respond. We need civility across our nation. What we're seeing are symptoms of a bigger problem. This is a symptom. The problem is not gun laws. The problem is a lack of civility. I think a lot of changes need to be made as for the safety of handling the guns regulations of the guns, handguns, long arms, um, whatever you want to classify as an assault weapon. After reports surfaced that the Newtown gunman, Adam Lanza, suffered from autism, those on both sides of the gun control debate did seem to agree on one thing, that more attention needs to be paid to mental health policy. But mental health experts and advocates say the facts are being ignored in favor of a misguided attempt at consensus. I spoke with the president and co-founder of the Autistic Advocacy Network, Ari Naiman. I asked him whether the Newtown shooting has had an impact on those with mental disabilities. Schools were now looking at their children with additional suspicion. People who had perhaps recently made the decision to come out of the closet about their diagnosis at work or in their relationships suddenly started to feel that uh, that may have been a mistake uh, and that discrimination might be on the rise. If we look at the research and the evidence, there's no relation between Asperger's syndrome and violent crime. Even when we look at the small subset of people with psychiatric disabilities, who some studies have found to have an increased correlation with violent crime, that correlation disappears when we control for substance abuse. And that's actually one of the only things that does tend to correlate with violent behavior, a history of substance abuse, but not so much a mental illness or an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. And why do you think then there is this focus on and this consensus on the issue of mental health care then after something like Newtown as opposed to other issues? The gun lobby is powerful and the disability rights lobby is considerably less so. Uh, and that, I would say, uh, describes a considerable portion of it. I mean, let's be honest here. It is very difficult to have meaningful legislative action on some of the broader issues relating to gun violence. Uh, people would like to believe uh, that this problem lies with some kind of other. And you, you see this in a lot of instances, okay? When there's an instance of violent crime involving, um, you know, say, an African-American or Hispanic youth, people start talking about gang violence. When there's an instance of violent crime involving Muslim Americans, people talk about terrorism. When the shooter is a Caucasian male, people suddenly look to 
psychiatric or neurological disability because it's some way of saying the problem isn't here at home, the problem is over there with those kinds of people. That's wrong. It also leads to terrible public policy. We're joined now by Dennis Hennigan. He's a former vice president for the Brady campaign to prevent gun violence. And by Richard Feldman. He's a former lobbyist for the National Rifle Association, now president of the Independent Firearm Owners Association. Actually, it might, it might be useful to begin with the sort of proposals that President Obama made earlier this month. They include an introduction of criminal background checks on all gun sales, a more comprehensive ban on military assault weapons than that which expired in 2004, a ban on high-capacity magazines and armor-piercing ammunition. So those would need to be passed by Congress, but there are also 23 executive actions. Some make it easier for states to share relevant information, and other requires more research into the causes and prevention of gun violence. There's also a proposal for a responsible gun ownership campaign and a requirement that federal authorities trace the origin of guns recovered in the course of criminal investigations. Dennis Hannigan, these are the sort of measures you've been campaigning for for years. There's a great deal of opinion yes. and speculation right now in Washington about how likely it is that these measures will pass. Some of it optimistic, a great deal quite pessimistic, it has to be said. But what's your sense? Well, I think it's very exciting, frankly, that the President of the United States is putting the power of his office behind this issue. He has set out a very sensible program. Uh, it is a broad-based program, uh, but it is designed to deal with a horrendous problem that our nation has suffered from for far too many years. A hundred thousand Americans shot every year with guns. Thirty thousand of them die. We lose eight of our children every day due to gun violence. The nation's sh conscience was shocked by the horror at Sandy Hook Elementary School, and this president responded appropriately. He acknowledged we have a problem. We cannot tolerate the slaughter, particularly the slaughter of our children, any longer, and he set out a sensible program that respects the Second Amendment rights of gun owners and still moves us towards a solid, comprehensive policy to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. Richard Feldman, as someone who spent a long time lobbying people on Capitol Hill not to move in this direction, um, do you feel a fundamental change underway right now as well? Do you think these, things, these measures will pass? Well, uh, it remains to be seen what's going to get through the Congress of the United States. But this is a dramatic moment. I, I think the world would be well advised to watch what goes on on this issue. This is truly democracy in action. And what we're starting to hear now on Capitol Hill is not from the talking heads here in Washington as much as the folks back home. You know, Dennis and I really have a lot of areas of agreement. Uh, we're all united in this country against people misusing guns, whether it's the criminal misuse or the deranged individual misuse of guns. And so much of this debate has really been about language which separates us instead of recognizing and focusing on the problem, which I, I was pleasantly surprised. I think the Vice President of the United States in our meeting three weeks ago uh, really did zero in better than I've heard in a long time on the problem. Many of the executive orders proposed by the President were things that came up in our meeting and I applaud them. Uh, the National Rifle Association has a different viewpoint and we're very lucky to have someone who was you know, very senior within the NRA. Um, help us understand what's driving them as they oppose the sort of changes being proposed. Well, the very thing that Wayne LaPierre of the National Rifle Association wanted most is one in one of the executive orders talking about funding additional armed guards at, at schools. I think that's an answer in certain appropriate instances, but it's far from the whole answer. Uh, this is a very complicated problem. It's multifaceted. The issues differ whether you're talking about the criminal misuse of guns, uh, people uh, troubled and using a firearm. Right, but, but you did once call the NRA a cynical mercenary political cult. Yes, I did. Why did you use those words? Well, I was referring to a time in NRA's history when they were looking around for issues. Um, and I said at the time, and I stand by it, I felt that some of the issues were really manufactured. This is not a manufactured issue. This is the real deal, and American gun owners are on DEFCOM 1. 
I need to make the point, though, that uh, it is the NRA that is the problem here, and, and the American people need to understand that. And it's not NRA's membership that is the problem. It is the leadership that is the problem. Well, well, let's take An a look. Extremist leadership that is going to dig in its heels and it's going to oppose every facet of the president's program, save the armed guards. That's the only thing the NRA is going to like. Which is quite controversial in some Which is quite con country, but controversial, but it's going to dig in its heels. It is the problem, and it is the task of the American people to rally in support of these sensible solutions and overcome the power of this special interest lobby. Well, let's look a bit closer at the NRA. The, the group has a 75-member board of uh, directors, CEO Wayne Lapierre. Uh, who was just mentioned, he makes $970,000 a year. That's, that may become relevant as we talk about the difference between grassroots and leadership. According to the NRA's income statements, it's made more than $200 million each year since 2010. More than half of that money comes from fundraising, sales, advertising, and royalties, much of which is generated through its relationships with its corporate partners. Many of those include gun makers, sellers, and, and contractors from the company formerly known as Blackwater, we, we can't necessarily keep up with what they're called right now, to manufacturers like Arsenal and Glock. According to NRA tax returns from 2004 to 2010, the group's income from fundraising, which includes money from gun makers, grew twice as fast as the money it received from members' dues. So, Richard, I mean, that always leads to the question then, who are they representing right now? Is it um, some notion of defending the Second Amendment? and of preventing the government from overreach and, and tyranny, or is it simply the bottom line of gun manufacturers and indeed many of the, the Wall Street private equity firms that own them uh, who depend a great deal on the secondary unregulated market to make that money? Well, when I worked at the National Rifle Association, we were very clear we represented uh, firearm owners. We didn't represent the industry. That was other organizations. But when people complain about the power of the NRA, what they're really saying is, I don't like democracy when I'm not winning. And the NRA, whether you agree or disagree, and I've had my differences, uh, their strength comes from their membership and the folks back home. Take money out of American politics, you make an organization like NRA 20 times more powerful. Mayor Michael Bloomberg in New York could spend more money in an afternoon if he chose than NRA can raise in 10 years. But the reason these questions are being asked is because when you, when you poll gun owners, and, and the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health did release a survey just this week, uh, you find, and certainly in this poll, that overall 89% of Americans favor introducing compulsory background checks for all gun sales. And for gun owners, that number is 84%. 69% are in favor of a ban on assault-style weapons, and that's and 45% of gun owners support that measure, and 68% of those surveyed want to see a ban on the sale of large-capacity ammunition magazines, and, and even there, 47% of gun owners support that ban, and yet we're not even supposed to talk about this, according to Wayne Lapierre and the, and the NRA. Well, I think you asked uh, the right question, which is, who exactly does the NRA represent? Because another survey of NRA members showed 74% of NRA members support universal compulsory background checks. So the NRA on some of these issues does not represent its own membership. The NRA is driven by a tiny minority of gun owners who are ideologues on this issue and who are motivated to uh, do pretty much whatever the NRA asks them to do in terms of lobbying their congressmen, uh, you know, giving money to the right candidates, et cetera. Now, Richard calls that democracy, but what has happened on this issue is that the vast majority of the American people support policies that are constantly frustrated by the work of this tiny minority of gun owners acting through a very wealthy lobby that is funded in large part by the gun industry. So it, it is a conundrum of American politics, but it, it is clearly a perversion of democracy to year after year after year have policies that are strongly supported by the vast majority of the American people and of gun owners continually frustrated. Congress won't act because it's intimidated by this lobby that represents a tiny minority. Is there any interest, Richard Feldman, then, if, if the NRA uh, is indeed representing its membership and indeed uh, is there any interest amongst the manufacturers who help bankroll the NRA in safety issues, at the very least, then, looking at the design of guns and so forth? And, and I think at this point we should bear in mind that it's not um, homicide, gun homicide, that's responsible for the most deaths in this country. It is suicide. And then when you add that to accidental discharge, 
of a, of a, of a weapon. Those are different policy issues. Right, but the point is that but even, but even these yeah. policy issues, which will protect their members, well, if there was some kind of regulatory agency, are thought of to be completely you know, off the table. Guns are, are a particularly unusual kind of consumer device. If you make them very safe so they don't cause any injury, and you can, they also don't function as firearms. It's their very lethality that allows them to be useful. And the question that we sometimes avoid or often avoid in this country, we focus on the gun instead of the problem which is always in whose hands are the guns. Mm. And when we focus on that issue, Dennis and I will find ourselves in complete agreement 99 plus percentage of the time. But when we talk about good guns versus bad guns, semi-automatic, not fully automatic guns, they're already pretty much outlawed. Uh, then we get into this food fight that we got into 20 years ago in this country and will achieve nothing. But, but when we talk about achievement then, Dennis, what are we actually trying to achieve with more legislation? Is, is it necessarily another debate about the Second Amendment or is it simply to stop so many people getting killed? And again, not well, necessarily through, through homicide, but, but through you know, through accidents. Of course, some of those well, deaths the problem are is that legitimate. We're, you know, we're losing, we're losing uh, our fellow citizens unnecessarily every day. We're losing children every day in this country, and it's largely preventable. So this is all about saving lives, and there is absolutely nothing in the Second Amendment that condemns this country to a future of tolerating the one mass shooting after another after another that tolerates losing eight children every day. There are sensible solutions. Right, but is that framework yeah. that you're even introducing there, which is, which is perhaps muddying the waters, the, our children all the children in America are not dying because of mass shootings. Yeah. The National Academy of Sciences came to that conclusion, although they, they, you know, the only thing in common yes, is, is it's access to guns of, of these mass shootings. But they are, they are perhaps dying because of, uh, yes, access issues, design of, 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 gun, uh, of guns and so forth. These yes, are the issues that can be looked at in a public health Exactly. Framework. Well, exactly. The harm and minimization. As, and and, and the fact of the matter is, if the NRA really represented gun owners, the NRA would be working for safer guns. The fact that guns are designed to be lethal does not mean they should not have safety mechanisms to prevent the unauthorized use of those guns by children. And I, you know, we started suing gun manufacturers back in the early 90s because they, they wouldn't install simple safety devices right. that didn't cost much money at all that could prevent countless deaths of children who get access to guns. And only when we started suing them did they suddenly find it feasible to put internal locks right. onto guns. Only when we started suing them. The NRA should have been lobbying for those internal locks if it really represented I mean, And the owners. example often used, Richard Feldman, is car safety and, and the fight to get seat belts. Uh, in, installed in highway safety, you know, speed bumps. Once the car manufacturers very much drove policy through their lobbies on Capitol Hill and then slowly the campaign occurred. And it wasn't an anti-car lobby, it was simply a public safety lobby, a public health approach to say, okay, you know, we're not anti-cars, but how do we make them safe and stop people from dying in them? We're not going to change human behavior. Well, as Dennis knows very well, I'm the guy that negotiated the child safety lock arrangement and announced it in the Rose Garden with Bill Clinton on behalf of the firearm industry. Which got you ostracized. And you NRA. were ostracized yeah, by the NRA. Yeah. <laughs> that well, just proves they, the point. They, they, maybe they didn't care for who I was standing next to, but it doesn't matter to me. Our organization, the Independent Firearm Owners, uh, will meet with anyone uh, in leadership and policy makers any time in America. We want to be at the table. We're pro-gun, we're pro-law enforcement, and we're pro-intelligence solutions. And there are solutions to some of these problems. But it, and it is a problem not just with the people, but also with the guns. And a very good illustration of that is the question of, of why do we allow access to such extraordinary firepower in this country? Why is it possible in this country to buy a semi-automatic assault rifle equipped with a 100-round magazine like was used in the Aurora shooting? We know that limitations on firepower can save lives. A dramatic illustration of that was the Tucson shooting, where this guy had a, an ordinary semi-automatic handgun equipped with a 33-round magazine. He could fire those 33 rounds in a matter of seconds, not even pausing to reload. Once he had to pause to reload, that's when he was tackled and subdued. If we had had the original assault weapon ban in effect, which had a 10-round magazine uh, limitation, 
He could have been tackled after 10 rounds. And I would point out uh, that the nine-year-old, Christina Taylor Green, she was shot with the 13th round. Her life could have been saved. Richard Feldman, you better respond to that. It, it's an interesting argument, but there are over 100 million high-capacity magazines in existence in this country. To think now that we're going to stop the manufacture and have an impact on criminals or deranged people. But don't people. the statistics show that crimes tend to be, uh, and we're, we're talking about homicides now, as opposed to, which again is, is, is a minority of, of the killing, uh, people tend to use new, new, new weaponry, actually. People, it's, 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 those, those seem to be the statistics. They do, but there's going to be nothing in the proposed legislation that prevents the sale of older High capacity ammunition but, devices. But then that's why, I mean, it's, it's this sort of smorgasbord of, of policy. Well, so you have to deal with the world the secondary as we market see then it. becomes But you know, we, we actually yeah. tried this. For 10 years in this country, we had a ban on magazines in excess of 10 rounds in effect. And one study done by the Virginia State Police showed that uh, during that period of time, the number of crime guns in Virginia that were, were equipped with those high capacity magazines began to decline. As soon as the ban expired, the, the number of crime guns with those magazines began to go up again. So we actually have evidence that this law ha was starting to have an effect just when it expired. We ought to get that law back in effect and keep it in effect permanently. To what extent might, might it be helpful then to debunk some of the myths, to use and again, to be, to be based not, not on blame or discussions about the Second Amendment, but on science and analysis. So when you look at the National Crime Victimization Survey, yes. the, the main repository of information we have about crimes that involve victims, you find that it's very rare for guns to be used in self-defense. And in fact, actually, the, the research suggests that if you do use a gun, you're more likely to be injured than, say, if you were to run away or to call the police. Oh, I, I'd call that into question, and I can state as a matter of personal involvement that twice in my life as a civilian, not when I was a police officer, uh, I've used my handgun to prevent a crime from occurring against me. I've never had to fire it, but I've used it quite successfully. Well, these statistics, I suppose, I mean, often these statistics are, are put up. Um, it, it does seem sometimes, some of them without much attribution, whereas when we do have the National Crime Victimization Survey, they seem yes. to be pretty cast iron. I mean, all we, all we do know is having a gun in the house yeah. increases the risk of doing your self-injury, doing someone you love in, uh, injury, doing a friend injury, that, that's uh, a good or, point. or of killing yourself. And it's this good, is what we know. Yeah. So perhaps this is the basis for where we look at a harm reduction strategy, not about the Second Amendment, not impinging mm -hmm. on the right to bear arms, but a more practical way of going forward, perhaps. Well, I, I, I want to address that for a second. It misses an issue when you talk about having a gun in the home versus a home without a gun. The likelihood of a gun being used uh, either positively or negatively when you don't have one is zero. So it's not comparing apples to apples. I mean, homes without bathtubs don't have children that drown in the bathtubs no. that don't exist. Wait, wait, wait yes, Dennis. I mean, <laughs> that's true. What you have to wait look at is are you in better shape if you have the ability to protect yourself? And let's go back and to and some again, the victimization survey yeah. and other yes. services. Doesn't but matter, there's, but, but right. I, I, I'd have to challenge that. Well, I never reported in. to the police those two incidences. That's not part of the study right. because I prevented the crime from occurring. What was I going to report afterwards? It's about frequency, I suppose. Well, so, mm -hmm. let me challenge mm -hmm. something that Richard mm -hmm. just said. I mean, Richard's trying to trivialize these studies. In, in part of fact, what they show is that if you bring a gun into the home, the risk of homicide, not homicide by gun, homicide increases threefold. The risk of suicide, not suicide by gun, suicide increases threefold because you are bringing into your home a weapon that is so incredibly lethal compared to other weapons you might use or other means you might use to hurt people. So that's the point. Uh, now, so, we have a right in this country to have a gun in the home for self-defense. So this is a matter of each individual family making a determination of whether it's wise to bring a gun into the home. It is far that, more likely... Relevant? Shouldn't it be actually about regulation to make sure that if and when you do bring a, a gun in, into your house, as is your right, yes. um, that it is as designed as safely as possible? It, it should be designed as safely as possible. There ought to be laws on the books that penalize gun owners for leaving guns accessible to children when those children use guns to hurt people. There needs to be a sense of gun owner responsibility and accountability. And so, yes, we ought to make guns safer 
and we ought to make gun owners more accountable for what they do with their guns. That is part of a very complex solution. Uh, it is not addressed in the president's proposals. Uh, we hope that eventually it will very be Very quickly, Richard, why should any of that be any more controversial than putting seatbelts in cars? Well, I don't think we can make guns safer, but we can make gun owners much safer. And that's about education. One of the president's executive orders was in establishing a national firearm safety and responsibility program. I hope very much to be working with the administration in doing just that. I believe in education. Uh, we've done great things in this country when we focus on a problem and we educate people. Uh, but that kind of education should be compulsory. It should not be voluntary. It should not be up to the gun owner. If the gun owner is going to act, is going to, is going to have this lethal weapon in his house, he, he should be trained on how to use it safely, on how to store it safely, and the NRA will never go along with compulsory uh, well, training. Well, because it's going to be used as a prohibition for people obtaining guns. Now, Dennis, I'll agree with you when it comes well, to look, mandatory driver cars. training has not banned cars. And I you don't, don't understand need that. Driver education to drive a vehicle on your own property. You're talking about having the gun in your house. You're talking about I can take my 10-year-old and let my 10-year-old drive on my 15 acres in New Hampshire. But the fact uh, of the matter is a gun in the home is not just a threat to those who live there. A gun in the home can be a threat to the, the neighbor's child who is visiting that home and others who All come right. into contact with the gun-owning family. We're going to leave it there. Clearly these issues of trust are very important to us to the government and to other authorities. We'll be dealing with those in our, in our third and final part of our series. Dennis uh, Hennigan, thank you very much. Richard Feldman, thank you. Uh, thank you. And on the third and final part of our special series on guns, culture and crime in the United States, we'll be in Baltimore, one of the most dangerous cities in the country, to examine the strategies authorities are implementing to curb gun violence and hearing why inner city residents feel they do need firearms. 50% in general is just pure survival because you know it's, it's a lot of wolves in your city and you refuse to be that one sheep that just gets taken for everything. So you know in your heart you're a good guy and you don't intend on hurting anybody, but the next man may hurt you, you're going to get a gun. That's coming up on Friday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern at 0030 early Saturday GMT. But for now, that's it from the Inside Story team.